Good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to be with you. Uh, we're continuing our series called Restored as we look at the very end of the book of Isaiah. And today we're in Isaiah chapter 58. And so if you want to go ahead and turn there, we'll read in just a few seconds. Uh, there's a phrase that appears in Isaiah 58 um, that is a word of hope for us. That as we've been journeying through this last few chapters of Isaiah, what we've been listening for is the work of God among us to restore us. How do we follow the Spirit into healing? And so as we gather around this passage this morning, I hope you hear these words. Healing will appear. Healing will appear. Let's read together. Isaiah 58, starting in verse 1. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. And declare to my people their rebellion. And to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. Exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed? Or for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry, to provide the, your food, uh, sorry, provide your poor, the poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked, to clothe them, not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you this morning, much like our ancient brothers and sisters, who yearn to be close to you, want your presence among us. and who show up here in this place to bow our heads, to lift up our hands, 
declare, confess that you are our God. Trusting that because you are our God, that there is life available to us. That there is a light that we have seen. And we long for the, for the day when there is no more night. And with that confession, that hope that we have, we pray that once again your voice would awaken our senses. Senses that have been dulled to pain in the world. The cataracts that cover our eyes that prevent us from seeing the ways in which we have been a hindrance to that light at times. But Father, I pray that you might heal us. That you might find a way to open our ears so that we might become exactly as you would have us be. And that we might see your will done here on earth just as it is in heaven. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, this, this passage starts in kind of an odd way. It says, shout it aloud. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Which raises the question, why does Isaiah have to be so loud here? And I think it's because they don't know they have a problem. They assume that everything is fine. And so for Isaiah to get their attention, he's going to have to get loud. To show them, declare to them, things are not all right here among us. And this is a shocking announcement. Because they've come back into the land, they were in exile, and they're trying to rebuild their cities trying to do things the right way this time. They know that they messed up before. And part of what they messed up on is they forgot God. That their worship places were empty at best. At worst, they were dedicated to other gods. And they say, okay, we don't want to do that again. We know that we messed up. And this time, we're going to do things differently as we as we rebuild our life together, as we rebuild the temple for us to worship in, we're not going to make the same mistakes. And so people are coming to worship. They are committed to showing up to worship the God who has rescued them out of exile. And so they're surprised when Isaiah tells them there's a problem. That no, 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 Isaiah, you can't, that can't be right. We're doing things the right way this time. I know before we didn't worship God well, but now, no, we, we are dedicated at the temple. We're showing up for worship. How could anything be going wrong? In fact, they've been so committed that they're starting to get a little annoyed. They're getting annoyed with God. Because they feel like he's not holding up his end of the deal. That God, look, we are doing exactly what you told us to do. We've come back home. We re we're rebuilding things. We're worshiping you and you alone. Now, where are you at? You haven't shown up for us. You said if we would worship you as you've called us to, then you would restore us. But look around. The city's still in ruins. Crops are failing. I'm worried about what my child, if my child's going to have enough to eat. Things are in chaos. 
Where are you, God? We're doing what we're supposed to do. It's time for you to hold up your end of the deal. It's time for you to do what you said you would do. And God's response to that is basically this. Really? Because as he's looking at it, he sees all kinds of problems. Yes, you are showing up to worship. That's wonderful. And you're even going above and beyond. You're, you're fasting. You're taking that seriously. You're fasting. But your fasting ends with you throwing punches at each other. All your fasting is doing is making you hangry. <laughs> this is not my intention. In fact, I specifically remember telling you to love your neighbor as yourself. I specifically remember telling you to feed the hungry, provide shelter for the homeless, to clothe the naked, and instead, what you're actually doing is actively taking advantage of the most vulnerable among you. You're still acting like the Babylonians do, even though you're showing up for church here in Israel. And there's a problem there. It's wonderful that you're committed to showing up for church, but you're still living in, a way, in ways that are opposed to my purposes for you and for my good creation. You are fasting, yes. But your fasting isn't making you any hungrier for God's justice, for God's setting right of all things. You think you're doing what I want you to do. But in fact, you're missing the point. That there's this huge gap between what Israel confesses with their lips in worship and the way they actually live their lives outside of the temple. And they're blind to it. They think they're fine. They think they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so one of the things that Isaiah 58 wakes us up to is the power of self-deception in our spiritual lives. How easy it is to fool ourselves and how easy it is to confuse being religious for being righteous. It turns out those are not the same thing. And in fact, we can often use our spirituality, these acts of worship, as a cover for our bad behavior. To think that we get a pass on how we're treating other people because, well, I'm worshiping right. I think about a blog post that I read by Richard Beck, a professor at ACU a while back in which he recounts this conversation that he has with a student of his. And the student's going through a lot. There's some family turmoil, and she's coming uh, to Richard to ask for some advice. They start talking through some things. And at one point, she says, I, I think I really just need to work on my relationship with God. And his response was, why would you do that? Which sounds weird, right? Hold on. She gets confused. What do you mean, why would I do that? Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? And Beck's response to that was, is there anyone in your life that you've wronged and that you may need to ask forgiveness of? And she thought for a second. She said, yeah. Said, why don't you do that? Why don't you go and do that work? Because that's actually a great way for you to work on your relationship with God, too. Uh, he continues kind of uh, talking about this conversation, unpacking what it means uh, later in the blog. This is a longer reading, but hang in there because it's, it's worth it for us. This is what he says about that conversation. Obviously, I was a bit provocative with the student. 
And I did go on to clarify, but I was trying to push back on a strain of Christianity I see in both my students and the larger Christian culture. Specifically, when the student said, I need to work on my relationship with God, I knew exactly what she meant. It meant praying more, getting up early to study the Bible, to start going back to church, things along those lines. Of course, and please hear me on this point, nothing is wrong with those activities. Personal acts of piety and devotion are vital to a vibrant spiritual life and continued spiritual formation. But all too often, working on my relationship with God has almost nothing to do with trying to become a more decent human being. Christianity has essentially become a mechanism for allowing millions of people to replace being a decent human being with something else an endorsed spiritual substitute. The point is that one can live a life full of spiritual activities without ever actually trying to become a more decent human being. And much of this activity can actually distract one from becoming a more decent human being. In fact, some of these activities actually make you worse, interpersonally speaking. Many churches are jerk factories. Which I love. Jimmy Sue said she was going to start telling people she works at a jerk factory, which I love that. He says, take, for example, how Christians tip and behave in restaurants. Anybody ever worked in restaurants? Yeah, you can attest to this, I'm sure. If you've ever worked in the restaurant industry, you know the reputation of the Sunday morning lunch crowd. Millions of Christians go to lunch after church on Sundays, and their behavior is abysmal. The single most damaging phenomenon to the witness of Christianity in America today is the collective behavior of the Sunday morning lunch crowd. Because behavior at lunch isn't considered to be working on your relationship with God. Behavior at lunch isn't spiritual. Going to church, well, that is working on your relationship with God, but as we all know, any jerk can sit in a pew. But you can't be a jerk if you take the time to treat your waitress as if she were your friend, daughter, or mother. I truly want people to spend time working on their relationship with God. I just want them to do it by taking the time to care about the person standing right in front of them. I, I, I've been there myself. I, I remember in grad school getting to hang out with people who knew how to pray really well, guys like Randy Harris, who I idolized. He seems like Yoda. I want to have the same kind of wisdom and relationship with God that he has. And he would teach us how to do contemplative prayer. And something I'd never heard about. You're sitting in silence and meditating, and it's, it was great. I loved learning how to do that. And I would come home and tell Kristen all about it. Babe, I'm a contemplative now. <laughs> I am one with the Lord. And she would say, that's great, baby. But when are you going to learn to empty the dishwasher? We, we can miss the point so easily. Pour ourselves out into these spiritual practices, but fail to be the kind of human being that loves other human beings well. And if we're not careful, we can begin to believe that all God really wants from us is ritual. That what God wants from us most of all is a great worship service, however you define that. And that if we love God hard enough and well enough, then we can ignore the part about loving your neighbor as yourself. We get a pass on that because we've done this part so perfectly, so well. And why are we tempted to do that? I think a lot of it has to do with fear. Because we know that the way of Jesus is challenging. We know it's hard. We know there is sacrifice that comes up along the way. If we're going to follow Jesus all the way to the cross in hope of resurrection. And if we're going to be a people like that, it can be terrifying to think about where that might take me. To think about what it might cost if I were genuinely committed to loving others the way God has called me to love them. And so we're desperate to believe that we're fine, we're good, without paying the price that genuine goodness 
might require of us. And try to build a spiritual life where we pretend that if we love God, we don't actually have to love our neighbors. And here's the thing. Scripture will not let us think that. I mean, across the board, there are scriptures after scriptures to confront that way of thinking, of approaching that version of religion. And so think about in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3, to do what is right and just is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. Or jumping down into Amos chapter 5, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Or in Matthew 5, the same kind of advice that Richard Beck gave to that young student, we hear Jesus saying something very similar. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. Don't do your act of worship first. Go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. Or in James 1, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We are constantly trying to love God without having to love our neighbors. We are so gifted at missing the point. And so we need this word shouted out at us so that we can hear it clearly. Because the God revealed in Scripture cannot be worshipped rightly without our loving our neighbor. He wants more than worship from us. He wants us to be good. To live in a way that honors what He most deeply wants for his children and his creation. And our spiritual lives are incomplete until we've grown in that. And now here's the really important part, though. Because the temptation when we hear passages like Isaiah 58 or the ones I just read are to think that worship doesn't matter. That worship doesn't It's kind of second tier. It doesn't really matter for your spiritual life. But that's not what's happening in this passage. God is not upset with them because they are fasting. It's because they're not fasting deeply enough. God is not upset with them because they're fasting. It's because they're not fasting deeply enough. He doesn't want them to stop fasting. He wants them to fast better. And here's the critical piece. Israel never would have gotten to the place where they are able to hear what God says to them in Isaiah 58 if they hadn't been showing up for worship in the first place. It's easy to hear Isaiah 58 as this word of condemnation, of judgment. But I don't think that's what's happening here. This is not primarily a word of condemnation. What it is, is an epiphany. These people have been gathered around the the temple hearing the words of Scripture quoted and read over them, singing songs, and finally they did it long enough that the voice of God actually broke through and they could see what He actually required of them. It's because they showed up for worship that they're able to hear Isaiah 58. He doesn't want them to stop fasting. He wants them to fast more deeply. And maybe you've heard this sentiment and probably tons of sermons, Uh, this quote from Billy Sunday, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. Or I kind of like the updated version from Justin Bieber. Uh, You don't need to go to church to be a Christian. If you go to Taco Bell, it doesn't make you a taco. Same idea. (laughs) And of course, there's an element of truth there, right? That just showing up is not going to do that work within us. Can you go to church and miss the point? Of course, yes. But that doesn't mean we should stop coming. We've got this strange idea that if going to church doesn't automatically make you a Christian, then there's no point in going at all. 
I think about my membership at the gym. I've been working out at 24 Hour Fitness. Gerald Bindele kind of made me. Um, just having that membership is not going to give me a six pack, right? But if I want a six pack, I'm going to have to go to the gym, right? I think the same thing happens with our spiritual lives. Just coming to church, just showing up, just being in the building, being with one another, does it automatically do that? But we're not going to become the people that God called us to be without that. That there is a role that church plays, that worship plays, that is indispensable. You may not automatically become a Christian by going to church, but there is nowhere else you can go to become one either. We need this. We need one another. And so we keep showing up so that the Word of God might surprise us. The Word of God might confront us and show us a more deep adoration and discipleship and following of the one we have confessed we want to follow. But in order to receive that, we have to keep showing up, as flawed as we may be. Uh, I, I went to the dentist this week uh, because Bobby Stephen made me. And <laughs> these elders, I'm telling you. I, I, went, I went to the dentist, and of course, the, the worst part of going to the dentist is always the question. You know what question I'm talking about, right? Are you flossing? And then you have to decide, am I going to lie or not? <laughs> but I was able to tell them, actually, I am. Because I found these cool, cool little toothpick things, right? Maybe some of you use them. They have the little string inside the toothpick, and you can just do that. It's way easier than getting all the rope and tangling yourself up. <laughs> and, they, and I said, is that okay? Like, does that count? And they said, eh, it's better than nothing. Right? If, it's, if the choice is between doing that and not doing anything at all, keep doing that. And I think that is true for our spiritual walks as well. That as flawed as we may be, all the assumptions that we carry that need to be corrected by the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, all the, the flaws and things we're blind to, we carry all of that in here but showing up, even as flawed as we may be, gives God an opportunity to do something within us. That if we keep showing up, even if it's misdirected step after misdirected step, we can trust the Holy Spirit to eventually guide us into God's calling and purpose for us. I think about... the conversation that Thomas Merton, one of the great spiritual masters of the 20th century, one of these guys that is a contemplative, he had this conversation with a young activist who was very troubled, a young priest actually, who wanted to be an activist, very troubled by what was going on in the world and wanted to do more about it. And so he comes to Thomas Merton, this, this wise figure, and has this conversation with him where he asks, okay, what what do I do? I am so troubled by the world. I want to do more. I know it's wrong. But I don't know what to do. And I'm scared to act. What advice do you have for me? And this is what Thomas Merton told him. And I love this. In response to that question, Thomas Merton says this. Just take the time to become what you profess to be. Take the time to become what you profess to be. Take the time to become what you profess to be. That's what we're doing, church. Every time we gather, every time you open Scripture, every time you pray, if we'll have patience with ourselves, what we're doing is we're taking the time to become what we profess to be. We profess to be followers of Jesus, followers of the way. And of course, we all fall short. There are ways in which we are not fasting deeply enough. 
that if we'll be patient with ourselves. Over time, slowly, the word of God breaks through. And healing will appear. Let's pray together. Father, we lift up our hearts to you. And you know them so well. You know that we are blind and self-deceived. We are lost in so many ways. And yet at the same time, we have gathered here. Because we've heard your voice. We've seen some small glimpse of you. We've felt your presence. We've been convicted by your word. And so we gather here and we gather here to confess that we want to be your people. Will you make us your people? Father, help us to be patient with ourselves as we wait for our healing to appear, trusting that you truly are faithful in your healing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.